we could be starting um, it's one o'clock now so let's go so um, I'm here to talk about turbocharging your um, Drupal syndication with Node.js. That's going to be a bit of a story from what were, what were what our requirements and where we went with them and where we're aiming next. Um, so it's a bit of a case study more. But we'll go into uh, somewhat into details as well. So. Um, what I expect you to already know, or what I won't be explaining, is uh, you should be understanding something from of PHP and JavaScript as well. Um, some understanding of Drupal's internals and uh, some modules. We'll talk about them a bit. And some idea on how, especially NoSQL, Solar uh, work. I don't know if I'm going to even mention Varnish. I don't know why I say that in the slide. Anyway, good to know how Varnish works. Anyway, you might need it. Some other thing. Um, what I try to help you learn is uh, how can you use Node.js in real life to accelerate your content delivery. Now, I've seen some uh, Node.js presentations before. Um, I think I was in one in DrupalCon Munich. Um, it was kind of a sidetrack from delivering content from Drupal, so it kind of didn't explain anything uh, about delivering content of Drupal with Node.js. So we're, we're going to talk about just that. And um, then we're going to talk about why. Why do you need to uh, accelerate your content delivery? Um, we have some specific needs, and I think they should be pretty common. Uh, especially in these kind of situations. Um, and then we're going to briefly touch on how Node.js scales compared to Drupal. Um, it's comparing apples to oranges, but still, you'll get the idea on what it's all about. Um, my name is Carl Lavarisvith. I work for Hexo, which is right there on top. Um, um, and about the Excel, you can read it on the slide. We're about 70 people based mostly in Finland currently. Um, I've been working with Drupal since, professionally since 2007, and I remember evaluating Drupal 3 back in the day before we decided to build our own CMS, which is always a bad decision. Don't do that. Especially these days, you shouldn't ever build your own CMS. Um, the project, um, um, what we, well, end, ended up with all this um, information I'm trying to deliver to you is, um, is a service built for uh, Nelonen, which is a Finnish TV broadcaster. It's owned by Sanoma. Um, Sanoma owns a bunch of TV channels in Finland, but they also own, uh, they also operate here in Netherlands. They own SBS. I don't know how big or small it is here, but it's apparently been, been a, not, not that good of an investment so far. But um, anyway, our system is used only in the Finnish operations. We have some talks about whether it could, it could work in, in um, SBS as well. Um, the platform is used to run their um, video service online. Basically, that's um, that's a catch-up. It was originally a catch-up service, so they present you ads. Basically, sell a new set of ads and show it show that their TV content for seven or fourteen days catch-up on online, on like video on demand. And now later on, they added the subscription. Um, what they call SVOD, which is Subscription Video On Demand. Um, that means that you pay to get a subscription and then you can, usually for a way longer period, the, the contracts are usually two or three years, so you can look at the content whenever it's more like Netflix in that way. Um, 
they also um, stream live sports and essentially what they stream is the Finnish, <coughs> Finnish ice hockey league which in Finland is probably equal to soccer here in, uh, in uh, the, the Netherlands. Um, Finns really like their sport. Um, it, it's, it's been watched quite a lot and it's quite expensive I would say. I'm not a fan of ice hockey for some reason I guess I'm, I'm kind of a bad Finn in that way but um, I wouldn't pay what, what people have to pay to watch it. But, well, then, then again, I don't have to pay for watching it. Um, all right. The architecture. Um, all right. Uh, we have a video content management system that's um, a 777. There's a um, linear TV programming, which is, they call it linear TV. That's, that's the TV you have home that you can you know, turn a channel on. Linear TV programming, as well as uploaded content, come um, it, uh, are fed to the system. So basically, linear TV works in a way it's coming from a uh, from their ERP system to the to the content management. And um, what it does for that content is it delivers it downstream, where there's multiple clients, there are websites, there are um, basically affiliate sites and, and all that. Sanoma is a big corporation, so they have a lot of uh, newspapers and, and magazines and stuff, and they all want to use videos, so they use this platform mostly for that. Um, there are iOS clients, there's uh, smart TV apps and stuff like that on the downstream. Um, of videos, the system only handles metadata, so when we get an uploaded video, we, you can upload videos there. Uh, most of the videos don't come uploaded. They come from an automatic system, which is their production video production system. We handle the metadata, obviously. So we don't we don't handle video files in Drupal. We just you know you upload it and then we pass it on. We don't touch it anymore. It's it's going to to video video binary handling system from there, which is also built by us, but it's not Drupal. Um, the CMS handles all the metadata, which which is where it where it shows whether it's within a product, uh, connected to a product, uh, who owns the video, what's the description, what's the, uh, the images that it has, the stop image, um, that kind of stuff, and the rights. The rights are obviously very important, so the, the privilege is that how long you can watch it and where, and stuff like that. It also handles resolutions and, and bit rates and stuff like that. Um, videos are streamed from, from um, multiple streaming locations as directed by, by the CMS. Um, they st currently stream from um, Nelanen's own video streaming um, streamer. Basically, they have a really, well, they have a couple of servers that can stream content. Not that good these days, I think. And, and then all the live content and the high, really popular content are coming from Akamai because they only can stream, I think, 20 gigabits per second. And last Friday they were running at 32. So you can't do that with, you know, 20 as a limit. So you have to stream it from Akamai. Um, um, especially the live ice hockey, um, the uh, finals, for instance, are hugely popular. So. This is how it originally kind of looked. This is what we were thinking that there's a video content management system here, and then we just, you know, stream content to the two sites that were there at that point. Um, the Drupal in the middle is um, focusing solely on content management, so it's not delivering any HTML. It's only it's delivering um, JSON feeds um, out uh, to the downstream. And and um, it's a, it's a, well headless Drupal if you if you want that's that's been a buzzword lately I think it well you only you only use the admin side that's that's okay um, there are custom modules for um, integrating to the TV ERP system which is uh, I think built in 1997 so I'm just not going to comment anything on the system but we get XML from that system. Um, and it gives us um, 
linear TV programming like three, four months forward. So we might get quite a lot of broadcasts and, and TV dates and stuff. Then the Drupal also uses a custom module for controlling the binary video binary management system, which is which, con which controls the actual video files. So Drupal tells them on which name, on which streamer, and why, and blah blah blah, and the, and the binary management system does what it's told. And then what Drupal does is it <coughs> makes the makes the videos ready. Um, it, it checks that they actually are on the streamer, and then creates a node to mark the video to be able to be played so it's kind of a ready media node so that's that's the signal that you can play the video it's on the streamer especially for news clips and stuff going through that's essential so that when when it's finally went through conversion and went to the streamer then we know that you can you can play it um, and so yeah we had this and everything went great and then, then um, we got some more downstream clients, and then some more, and then a couple of more. And when we realized that, no, we really can't serve this all with, uh, with, with, with Drupal. So it's not like we didn't think of this at all when we started. Uh, we built the Drupal 7 on MongoDB field storage. Um, and it was standing on, on a fast database in a sense because MongoDB field storage stores the field information into MongoDB, as you know. Uh, and it, MongoDB, because of its nature, can, can store them in a kind of a more sensible way than MySQL. So it's faster with that. And also the views, the feeds that we were running, they were done with views and, and, a, and a JSON output module. And they were coming from a solar backend so that it won't burden the database. Um, <coughs> about the field storage, though, I have to say that it, it's faster. Um, and it's not really compatible with views unless you use it with EFQs. And EFQs, although they work well with MySQL, they don't work that well with MongoDB. I'd say that it's uh, we've moved away from from uh, MongoDB field storage at some point. I would say that unless you really know what you need to do with views, and there's no kind of sudden urge of creating new views, then you might be able to pull it off with uh, MongoDB field storage. But we didn't, so I can't recommend it. And there, there were lots, like some serious bugs in the system. So booleans didn't work at all. And, and then there were, there were all sorts of different trouble between the modules that go to MongoDB from EFQ, views, EFQs, MongoDB, and field storage, and so on. So it's a chain of modules, and then you have to be jumping between uh, issue queues and Drupal to dark. And when we moved it, uh, the database back to My MySQL, the MySQL almost crashed immediately. We had to, we had to move it on SSD disks, so it's actually, it, it did help quite a lot on the performance. But um, even though it did help, big feeds coming from Drupal, always, it's always kind of a problem. Um, the storage doesn't make a difference at some point. It's not about the storage. The storage isn't the, the problem. So you get to the point where the, the field API is just too extensible to be fast because you'd have, to, you ha you'd have to cache it. We'll talk about that a bit later. But if you run the field API, it's going to run it's going to run all the hooks. So it has fetch hooks, it has load hooks, it, ha it has you know, view hooks and stuff. It's going to run all the hooks for all the fields that you load and when you have 40 fields per item and 1,000 items per list, you're going to be calling it quite a lot, all the hooks. And when you get to that point, it's going to get really slow. You, you just can't get around it. And um, at this point, I, I think I know what you're thinking. Hey, you know, just 
we, we all have heard of this. Let's just put varnish on top of it. Get it over with. We can just, you know, cash it. Well, that's kind of hiding your problem there. But even though you could do that, the downstream clients, they have specific needs for the integration feeds. When you're downloading some um, content from somewhere, you only want the content you need to import. Otherwise, you have a lot of scrap content that you just need to go through. That takes quite a lot of time, especially when you have a Drupal downstream as well. So you want to have only the things that have changed since your last um, fetch. And basically, what we needed to do is allow the downstream clients to um, get the feed by the, la the seconds of last last import. So whatever seconds they gave, we gave everything that's newer than that. And then the downstream clients were happy. Now, them using seconds in the URL and we, we changing the page based on those seconds makes it really hard to cache because it changes kind of like, you know, every second. Um, so we couldn't cache it well. So we just we knew that we had to come up with some other idea of how can we serve the downstream clients well and still be able to cope with the with all the all the traffic coming in so we decided to index outside of Drupal um, first of all we did have a we, ha we did have some solar indi um, indexing already in place so we used Solar for, uh, um, for, for the views backend by Search API. Uh, at that point, they, I think they were just combining their uh, schemas. Um, but Apache Solar integration, which uh, enables us to index all content to an uh, external Solar server, seemed to fit the bill well. So we indexed the stuff to Solar, and then we decided <coughs> to distribute it out with a simple um, REST API. But there was a certain small problem because for some reason, and when you think about it, it's, it's kind of an obvious thing. The customer wanted to list the video feeds or to list the videos, um, especially to the clients, um, live. Uh, by popularity, obviously. So their videos, their news videos went viral and they wanted us to make sure that we always show the most popular video first. That means that we have to update so that we can order in Solar, we have to update the, the, the um, documents constantly. Now if you know anything about Solar is that Solar really doesn't index fast. It doesn't do that. That's not its thing. It indexes slow and it searches fast. That's, that's how, it, how, it's, how it does things. So when you get to the point when you have to add some field there, it's an index. So we, we tried different approaches. We, we were looking for solutions of um, two core, like sorting by other core, of, and we would just index the other core of Solar and stuff like that. And, and then adding without indexing a field that wouldn't make it index and everything else and well nothing worked so eventually uh, we just decided that we're gonna go with MongoDB because it has a diff it has a similar document or even more flexible document uh, storage mechanism because it's an OSQL server um, and you can index very fast well at least, even if you have a lot of keys, MongoDB will index so that it's not a problem, even though you index pretty much constantly. Now, we get to the point where I'm going to say that 2.6 has a problem because it, lock, it locks the whole collection and not just a single document. And that's due to the whole updating constantly thing. But that's going to go away in 2.8, I hope. Uh, but it, it still was way better than Solar in that. So. So um, then we were here, 
we have this, you know, MongoDB and there's our REST API delivering content outside. This part here is done um, by a Drupal module um, we use to index content straight to the, Mo the MongoDB. Now, it uses a straight connection to the MongoDB for performance reasons. We don't use an API to do that, even though we have been pondering on that and it kind of would make sense in an architectural sense. It would look quite a bit better if it would use an API, but currently it connects straight to the MongoDB um, and indexes all Drupal content. It works similarly as, as the uh, Apache Solar search integration. But it has, it's slightly a bit, well, it's a bit different. Obviously, it indexes into MongoDB and, and it tries to do it fast and without errors. We've had our share of problems with that indexing as well. Um, it also denormalizes the data for, for you know, optimized distribution. So when we have a layer of uh, different uh, content types that all contribute to the video, which is the end user sees just a single video. They don't, they're not, they don't care about the episode and the connection to the season and stuff. They just want to see which season, which episode, and then the video. So we de denormalize the data so that it's optimal to deliver from the MongoDB out. <coughs> and this is a contrib module, but it's currently in a sandbox. It's waiting approval. Um, because the guys decided that it's a good idea for the, for, the, for the guy who doesn't have create project rights in Drupal to Dark to do it, but well, it's their call. I guess it's gonna be in the queue for a while. Then we get to the delivery and distribution, which is the beef here. We have our data optimized for delivery in the MongoDB. And we want to deliver it out fast, but we also want some kind of a handle to touch it while we deliver it out so that we can see, we can handle the timestamps, we can search, we can use different sorting, different content owners, different um, hidden tags and stuff like that. And uh, here comes Snow.js to the rescue. Uh, Node.js, and here's a kind of brief introduction to Node.js. That's basically JavaScript running on the server. There's nothing kind of more magic to it. It's just JavaScript on the server. It's, um, it's run by Chrome's JavaScript engine, the V8 engine. Uh, and it's uh, non-blocking, event-based, as JavaScript is. And, and when, when, you, when you use it correctly, it's blazing fast. And when I say blazing fast, I just mean that it's about eight times as fast to run as PHP code on the server. And th that, that helps to make that, that and this non-blocking thing, so you can do things in parallel, it makes it really fast for certain things. I'm not sure how good it is with really complicated things like running Drupal. I think PHP is probably just fine for that, but it makes quite a bit of a difference in performance. And here I have this uh, scientific calculations of uh, the request per second. If you want to really know, uh, request per second with Drupal dropped under one at some point even though we had some proper hardware running it. And with, uh, with the Node.js backend request per second, run from 800 to 3,000 requests per second that we can deliver with the hardware we have. And now, if you want to get that, that kind of numbers from Drupal, you need to have quite a lot of servers or some caching, which means that you're not delivering it from Drupal. This is coming straight from Node.js. And the response times in, in, well, in Drupal, they went over a minute at some point um, to get that list out. And in, in, in the Node.js backend, they're from 
80 milliseconds to maybe 150 milliseconds, something along the lines. So there's the difference. Um, and now when we're running Node.js, we, we didn't use originally any Node.js framework. We started with just a really simple implementation. I would say now, now thinking about it, I would say that we could have probably used uh, a framework. It wouldn't have hindered our speed or something like that that much. Um, and um, because currently MongoDB is the bottleneck, so when we get to the limits of, of this, the platform's performance, it's it's not within the Node.js, it's within the MongoDB, which can't handle the, the, the query numbers at some point. Also, we don't use a fronting Nginx. Uh, requests are go, they go straight from a, from a, from an F5 to the servers and they get served by Node.js itself, listening to the port, and it handles them by process signaling, so it uses sub-programs, which are separate, so that we don't kill any other programs if, if we fail with something, but it, it could be, I think, again, we probably at some point, we, we were gonna put Nginx in front I'm not sure how much that's going to slow it down. We were supposed to test it last week, but didn't have time. Um, if you have any experience in how much slower Node.js is with Nginx up front, I, I would be really interested in hearing that. And um, it's running on, currently, the, the setup is running on three nodes. They share a uh, MongoDB replica set across those three nodes, and it's fronted by an F5 uh, load balancer. The three nodes are all pretty sturdy. They, I think they have eight CPUs and 32 gigs of RAM. The code itself is, is very simple. It's from very simple to pretty simple. Uh, the different backends, they are all separate services as said uh, in, 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 um, in Node.js. And they just mostly what they do is pass content out from the MongoDB. That's what we do. We have, we have the content optimized for delivery in the MongoDB. So we just pass it out as fast as we can. There are filters that we validate, obviously. So if you use some filters, we validate them. We also can do some other processing. Uh, I'll mention that in... Uh, well, yeah, I, I think I don't have the slide of, for that. So it does other stuff like um, um, it can validate security tokens, and it it um, it, va it validates your session, it validates your uh, subscription, and it can deliver a security token for viewing protected streams like the ice hockey. Um, so that means that we can run. On top of the Node.js platform, we can run iOS clients, the Samsung TV client, Android clients, Windows Phone clients, without anything else. There's no other back backend for them. So they just list the videos from there, and you can, they can log in to the Node.js. There's a there's a single sign-on server behind it, but but the Node.js can deliver the the credentials there and give you a session. <coughs> and um, it also stores the user rights and the product information locally, so that the user, the user subscription information is coming from the sales platform, which is a different system altogether. It's something horribly far away and horribly Java-ish. I haven't seen it. I don't want to touch it. Um, and then we deliver, I think, ice hockey live statistics for all the clients that are currently viewing the stream. You have the, the video there, and you have the, then the statistics under it. We deliver the statistics, obviously. Um, and then we handle extensive logging for the whole platform, which is basically that we have a single place where we log, because the videos go through a, a number of systems before they arrive at their destination. So we, we want to log them all in one place so we can see from the video 
when you go to the Drupal and you can open the log, the log comes from outside Drupal, but you can see from the log where the video was and where it's now. Um, currently, the bottleneck is, um, as MongoDB has said, so it's, it's doing really well, the Node.js here. When, if we get the MongoDB to be like super fast at some point, we might hit the next limit that we might hit would be the TCP connections on, on Linux. We actually uh, optimized them quite a bit at some point because when you, when you run, when you try to deliver three and a half thousand requests per second, or like 3,000 requests per second, you are bound to have quite a lot of TCP connections open at the same time. So you have to optimize those uh, socket numbers and stuff like that in, in, in Linux. Linux won't by default serve that, that, that many. Um, here's just a glimpse of the API documentation we have. As you can see, there are different filters and order by and you can limit the times and then there's some versions, popularity from version 2 and stuff like that. We're trying to serve the customers, which are the users of the API, as well as we can, so that we try to keep the documentation up to date at all times. For the Node.js, we're using the uh, cluster NPM mod module. The, the ones of you who have used Node.js, you know that by default, the main program will all only hang around in one core. So if you have multiple cores, you need the cluster so that you can start it start running in every core. Um, and then we use forever to keep it running, even though it might crash if it has some bad input from somewhere, which is usually the SM Liga, the, the Ice Hockey League statistics server that used to give really crappy XMLs to it. And if, if we weren't careful, careful with them, it, it might actually crash the uh, back end. But for the, no, for the for the generic Node.js, for the PHP programmer, it's quite a change. Um, I would say that it, it might look like, well, I've been doing JavaScript for quite a long time, so it's okay. I can program JavaScript, but it's not quite the same thing when you're doing it in the back end and you have to do quite a lot of things with it. Um, there are not, there, there's just in front end, it's mostly like events happening and you doing some DOM alterations based on that, that or Ajaxing something from the back end. But in Node.js, you really have to do parallel programming. So all the function calls, all the, all, all the calls from different systems, they are running asynchronous synchronously so you have to handle that somehow you have to understand that they return when they return and when they return you have to handle it whatever they return at that point and you're not in that part of the code at that point you're already running something else so there are npm mod modules to help it uh, like promises that's uh, I think that makes it quite clean to handle the asynchronous uh, function calls but other than that, I would say that even though it might be a bit hard for a PHP programmer, it's also pretty eye-opening on what you can actually do with programming languages. Um, especially, like, you know, if you've been in, in, in PHP for, for a long time. During the lifetime of the project, which it's, it's been live for like 18 months now, We've been building it longer than that, like two and two and a half years, and the previous system as well before that. Um, both Node.js and MongoDB, they have evolved quite a bit. I would say that MongoDB may be even more than Node.js. Um, MongoDB has added, they have added quite a lot of new features that we all, all, all have liked quite a lot, um, like, um, connecting or using two array uh, indexes at the same time for a query, which helps quite a lot if you have, like, uh, you have to combine two tags and then search based on that and have an index, because obviously you want to have an index. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, MongoDB 2.6 is out now, but 2.8 is 
rumored or announced to have um, document level locking. So we would much like to see what that will do for our lock locking times because currently the locking times are uh, quite high, especially with high load because we update a lot of content uh, constantly due to the popularity and also due to the actual thing, actual thing that stuff changes quite a lot constantly. Um, what we have planned for next, um, we have some stuff cooking up here. Um, we're thinking of separating different Node.js services fully so that we might be able to move them um, to different servers at some point. There's a bit of a, there's a bit of a, there's like highly critical services and then there are certain services that, that don't have to be served within milliseconds because seconds is fine. So for instance, currently they released a uh, Windows, phone, Windows phone client, which probably here doesn't seem like it would change anything because Windows, who uses Windows phones anyway, but in Finland, for some reason, we had this thing called Nokia previously. Microsoft bought it, the, the phone services, but Finns for some reason still use uh, quite a bit of Nokia phones, which are our Windows phones, Windows phone phones. So that means that we get a lot of traffic when we have a working client for that. So there's a lot of traffic coming from the uh, different uh, mobile mobile applications, we have one Backbone.js front-end and we have different servers and new new consumers of our API are coming constantly from, with, from within their corporation. So we might want to be able to even scale more. So moving the Node.js services out, differentiating them so that we can have them on different servers, that's good. Um, also moving the actual MongoDBs out from the Node.js servers would be good. And, and especially if we get them to something that's really I, like fast with IO, like max IOPS thing, is, is, that sounds promising. I might want to mention that there's a, there's a front end, that the front end Drupal I mentioned earlier, there's a Drupal 7 front end for, this, for the actual site that, that's used by browsers. Um, that's not built by us. It actually, it's actually built by Wunderkraut. Uh, I didn't get paid for mentioning their name, by the way. Um, and um, that runs during rush hours with 30 servers. So we, we run with three on the background. So that's kind of the um, difference. And they have varnish on, on top. Actually, a couple of one, I think at least well, at least one varnish server which caches all the content so that it even doesn't get that much backend traffic. They can handle, I think, about 100 logins per second when people are logging in to there. And, and that's, they, I mean, it's not their fault, it's just Drupal isn't that good with high performance <coughs> stuff. Um, then there's uh, some Drupal optimizations that we're um, doing we're moving the integrations outside Drupal for clarity. So instead of modules, we would like to use an API with kind of the custom, custom um, video integration stuff outside Drupal and then just use the API. So we created a module, which I, I find odd that there wasn't one already, that fakes the Drupal 8 REST API on 7. It's <laughs> kind of handy if you maybe want to move to 8 at some point. Um, we also released that, um, but it, that was even released by some other guy who also didn't have project creation rights in uh, Drupal to Dork, so that's also in sandbox waiting approval. Let's see when that comes out. And uh, that's pretty much it. Um, that's my presentation. Thank you. Now, if you have questions, please use the mic there. Apparently, they're recording the whole thing. That There's a mic there. See? Try to walk there and then ask. Hi. 
Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Um, can you talk a bit about um, the MongoDB indexer module that you uh, wrote up? Mm -hmm. um, I think conceptually the idea is that content would be created on using the standard Drupal um, GUI and then it updates a MongoDB. Uh, yeah, it works similarly if you have source. used if you have if you have used the solar indexing uh, so solar services for instance like Apache solar search integration module it just stores the same content you have stored in Drupal outside whenever you change it the MongoDB works in similar ways so it doesn't touch Drupal's story mechanism it just hooks it and then stores the stuff outside of Drupal for easier access it doesn't you know it's not that spectacular module at all. It just stores stuff outside Drupal into a MongoDB. Okay. So, so it's a replica then, basically? It's just a replica of yeah, Drupal's content, but it obviously stores it in a slightly different way, so... Because it... Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You mentioned in the start that you were trying to uh, serve content based on popularity. Mm. Um, if all the clients connect to Node.js, uh, do they also write back to the MongoDB, or do they provide that data back to the to the Drupal instance? Actually, there is a backend for um, popularity that counts the videos, and it goes to a to a different. Um, there's a there's a sp separate service that that handles that data. It goes outside to a statistics server that handles the statistics that they use for selling ads to the content. But they they have, I think, currently. They were listing their tracking mechanisms. They had eight. I think they've added now one more. I don't know why, but they have, I think, nine tracking systems that track people using using videos. But one one of them is within the Node.js platform. So yeah, we do write write the video counts there, and we use that information to to change the popularity. Yeah, thanks. Right. Hello. Hi. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, <coughs> do you use any uh, test framework for the Node.js uh, backend? And if you do, what uh, what framework? Test what? test framework for, for like integration like testing or unit testing or we don't, API. Uh, well, yeah. For unit testing, we don't use anything currently. The, the, the code base uh, is pretty simple, and we could use it. Not a bad idea at all. Uh, but uh, the system. Walks, uh, is, is running in different uh, three different environments. So there's a dev environment, there's the staging environment, and then there's the production environment. We have the staging and the and the production environments are constantly tested by by a bunch of Python scripts. That some of them are just Python scripts, and some of them run Selenium. Uh, all are run by Jenkins server. So like integration <laughs> testing is is done by that, and it it basically what it does is. It tests that the system works in, in staging and in production. It just tries to see that nothing has stopped from it from you know currently running. So if there's a let's say a pause in new videos that's eight hours, we know that we need to alarm people because there's never a pause of eight hours in, in new videos, even during Christmas. All right, thanks. thanks. You're obviously powering quite a big site with a lot of traffic. Mm. Um, would it make sense to use Node.js to speed up smaller sites? Well, <laughs> it depends on the requirements, obviously. So I, I would. It, it, it depends on how slow, uh, how small, and how ca and can you serve it with with Drupal? It's extra hassle if you have content in Drupal and you can serve it with Drupal. Let's say headless Drupal to to the to the front end. I, I would say that why not use just Drupal for it if that's okay. Obviously the um, the average response times are in Drupal. Even though there would be no traffic, they're still pretty high. So if you if you fetch a lot of content, it's going to take a while. So that that might be help with Node.js. But I think this is something that that needs to be used. I think well. I'd say that this is something that I would use in, in, in situations where I really definitely need the, the performance of the back end. Thanks. Thanks. Why didn't you go look for something 
that's more suited for your needs than Drupal. Because it seems to me that you, you could actually just find a content management system that might do stuff on MongoDB in the first place, so you don't have to uh, do the conversion to MongoDB, or <coughs> just use Symfony uh, instead, because it Symphony, so Symphony, well, <laughs> well, Symphony isn't isn't the solution here. I mean, Symphony isn't. If if you use Symphony, I think properly, I think it it kind of you know it likes to have an SQL database behind it to to f fully use its uh, capabilities. And and Symphony is, uh, I'd say, um slow as well anyway you can't you can't deliver that you can content out with that so you still have to have the node.js there so building a cms on node.js because there are no proper cmss in node.js like if you if you've seen ghost which is the you know the best cms in node.js that's like wordpress one in functionality it's it's like it's so far away from drupal these days so it, it's it's not a thing and Besides, what I what I kind of you know didn't focus on this uh, this uh, presentation is that obviously the uh, video content management system is the, it serves a lot of journalists and it serves a lot of content owners. It serves a lot of production companies. They need to have user groups, detailed user rights. They need to be able to you know configure the groups and and user rights and everything in detail. And and Drupal offers that out so of the box. So you don't really use it. Just as a headless thing, you actually use the content management system. Yeah, I, I used. Bit. Yeah, uh, well, uh, I don't use it for serving content, but I use the content management system itself extensively um, uh, in in b behind behind you know behind what you can see. So if you use an the iOS client, you, you can't see anything, but 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 in the background, the Drupal is uh, used quite a lot. Thank you. That makes far more sense now. Anyone else? Okay, that's it then, thank you.